that. And also, the first time I met Brother Stephen Cox was about 18 years ago. We was in a youth meeting at Grapevine Baptist Church in, guess that's Clemens, Louisville area. And I was sitting about back here where Robert's sitting, and I was sitting back there, and one preacher preached, and God moved in, and they called on Brother Stephen to preach. I'll never forget this as a young preacher in my entire life. He said, why would I want to preach when the Holy Ghost is preaching now? And he gave an altar call. I can't remember how many people got saved that night. And that always stuck with me. A man that knew to put God in front of his message. Knew that the Holy Ghost could do more in five minutes than he could in three hours preaching. And uh, I respected him a lot after that and followed him on Facebook a long time and was able to glad he was come to preach for us tonight. Preacher, you come on, mind the Lord. Preach as long as you need to. You got three hours? Yes, sir, that's fine. You need your phone. No, I'm good. No, okay. I'm good. Thank you. Right. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. If you take your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. I have enjoyed that gospel singing, didn't you? Wasn't that a blessing? Uh, man, alive. What a, what a blessing it was and a treat. I did not know that I would be hearing that tonight, but that is, a, that is such an honor. I do pastor in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, there and uh, came up the interstate and, of course, uh, had to go through Charlotte. My mom and dad live in Salisbury. So uh, Salisbury, just down the road. And uh, so I'm staying with my mom and dad, which are out of town. So I've got the whole house to myself. And uh, they knew I was coming. So they quick to, you know, booked a real quick trip somewhere. No, they, my dad's pastored the same church for 40 years. Uh, they're in Moxville, North Carolina. How many of you know where Moxville is? Mo Moxville, and uh, all of you do. So uh, Davie County, I was raised in Davie County. And uh, uh, was my dad's assistant there at the Trinity Baptist Church there in uh, Moxville for many years and then God called me to to Greenville uh, South Carolina and uh, that's where I've been the last nine years it's hard to believe it's been that long but uh, 18 years uh, Jonathan was telling me and I, I can't remember back 18 years I, how many of you can identify that uh, he was telling me things I forgot and uh, but, man I'm glad you brought that up to my my mind and uh, these were good memories going over there and preaching at the Grapevine Baptist Church uh, I know you love God's word you wouldn't be here on Tuesday night and uh, who has church on Tuesday night right is this your normal midweek so Wednesday night right and uh, so Tuesday nights this is great so it's an off night and you're here and uh, man that's wonderful I I love God's word and I preach God's word but I preach God's word verse by verse and so we just dive into the text and I hope that's what you are you're a lover of God's word and we're going to do something this evening in Mark chapter 1 we're going to look at verse number 35 and we're going to go all the way down to verse number 39. Now, this is the, this is the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus has just uh, got off the scene, uh, been baptized by John. And uh, John now is thrown in prison. And Jesus has started his earthly ministry, calling disciples. And, and uh, he hits the ground running right there in Capernaum in that area uh, where Simon Peter lived. And Jesus has started this ministry. I want you to look in verse number 35, and, and we're going to begin there in Mark chapter 1. The Bible says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he, Jesus, went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth, and he preached in their synagogues and throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good singing tonight. We thank you for the uh, Lord, the hospitality, and the uh, Lord, the, the dear folks that came out for this uh, Tuesday evening service. And Lord, uh, I thank you for the gospel heirs and for their gift of, of song. Lord, how they led us in worship and how they sang uh, some songs that I personally had not heard in a very long time. And I'm thankful that you, uh, Lord, uh, allowed them to speak into my life this, this evening. And uh, Lord, bring back some good songs. Uh, Lord, what a blessing. Now, Lord, as we examine God's Word, I pray that, Lord, you will speak to our hearts. We, we don't know what you would do on, on a Tuesday night in, in uh, Mooresville, North Carolina. We're not sure, uh, Lord, what you would do in the hearts of, of these people. But, God, I, I know this, that you've promised not to let your Word return void. 
Uh, Lord, if we preach it, Lord, faithfully, Lord, you've promised to bless it. And Lord, the Word is where the power's at. And I I thank you for that. It's not in me and it's not in my ability. It's not in my uh, performance. It's not in my, uh, Lord, my oratory uh, gifts or any way of delivery style. But Lord, it's in the Word. And I I thank you for that. Now, Lord, I pray that we, as we open up our our hearts, uh, Lord, that we'll not just hear the words, but be doers. And we'll be thanking you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when I get invited to uh, preach, uh, teach, wherever, often I'll, I'll uh, get to be invited at a, at a Bible college or a seminary and I'll, I'll teach some young students. Uh, here in the next few weeks I'll fly to uh, Pensacola Christian College and I'll uh, teach there at the college and in the seminary for a day or two and then a couple colleges maybe in the uh, southeast and uh, different where. And so I get the opportunity to, to teach preacher boys and, and uh, ministry students, missionaries, evangelists, even future pastors. And one of the questions that pops up often uh, when speaking to these students who are hungry for the word, often uh, the, the question is, Pastor, when do we find time in this busy world to study our Bibles, to get things out of it the way that you pastors do? When do we find time? When, how, do we, how do we walk with God in this busy world? How do we know what God wants us to do in this busy world? Now, I believe all of us in here this evening would admit that we live in busy world, right? We live in a busy day. I mean, uh, we all, y'all live in a busy town. I live in a busy town. Uh, we're everywhere. I mean, it doesn't matter uh, where you're at. There's cars everywhere and there's uh, billboards everywhere. And everything's being developed now. And, and it just seems like like uh, now that the cell phone has been invented for the last 20, 25 years, now anybody can get a hold of you at the just a push of a button where it used to be if you wasn't home, then you didn't really talk to anybody, right? And, and they had to wait. They left a voicemail really on the answer machine. How long has it been since you heard that? Answer, how many of you still got an answer machine, right? You, Praise God. Amen. Uh, my church don't even know what an answer machine is, I don't think. There's a few maybe. But, but you still got the answer machine. And, and you had to get home in order to talk to somebody. Hey, how about if you fast forward or, or maybe just maybe rewind rather and you go back maybe 30 years or, or 40 years where you had to read the paper to find out what happened. Boy, life was a whole lot more simple, wasn't it? You didn't have uh, breaking news on your phone. You didn't have all the news flashes. You didn't have all these things pulling at us, distracting us. You know what our Savior did in Mark chapter 1? He he had some distractions that he had to overcome. Jesus was being pulled to the urgent. I want to show you some things in in this text. Go go with me, Mark chapter 1. Just go back a few verses to verse number 14. Uh, In that same chapter, verse 14, the Bible says now after that John was put in prison, just as John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee. What was he doing? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The, one of the very first things that Jesus did when he, when he came into this earthly ministry, right after the dove uh, descended down upon Jesus and God, his father, said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He said, Hear him. This is him. This is me in the flesh. This is my God in the flesh. Hear him. Jesus began to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Well, here in this text, he, he rises up a great while before day. The disciples are looking for him and they find him and they, they say, Hey, Jesus, everybody is looking for you. Everybody is looking for you. Well, what are you going to do? And Jesus says to them, Let's go to the next towns that I may preach because that's the reason why I came. Now, I want to explain that to you in just a minute because we're going to do something a little different for the next few minutes. Instead of going from verse 35 down to verse 39, we're going to actually start at verse 39 and go up to verse 35. I want to show you why. Because tonight in this text, we're going to see the reason why Jesus rose up a great while before anybody else did. We're going to see why Jesus sacrificially prayed. He set the example for you and I because He knew 
what was about to take place. And it wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't a sinful thing. It was something that was distracting. I want to show you that. There's three things tonight that I want to bring to your attention. The first thing is that we, we have a commission. The commission we have is found in verse 39. Look with me in Mark 1 verse 39. The Bible says, And he preached in their synagogues and throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Jesus began his earthly ministry, what did he do? He, he began to preach. That word preach there in this text, in the Greek it means uh, uh, to herald. It means the arrival of a king. This is what they would do when a king would, would come in to a new area. They would have someone go a little bit before and they would say, Hear ye, hear ye, the arrival of the king. And everybody would stop at their whatever they were doing and they would stop and they would give obeisance to the king. It was heralding the message that the king was coming. This same word, preach, is heralding the message. And by the way, this is not just limited to Jesus. This is not just limited to your pastor or to me or to uh, these gospel singers. This is for everyone. We are commanded, church, to preach the gospel. The reason churches are dying all over this nation is because they have failed to get the message out of these four walls. When we fail to get the message out of these walls... We become inwardly focused and we start to uh, look at ourselves more of a social club and a get-together. And we start looking at, well, we're the church, our four no more. But understand this, the church should be a hospital. The church should be something that sends the gospel light out into the highways and the byways. That's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus began to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Look with me. Uh, Jesus heals this leper. Look, look in verse number 40, uh, just right below that uh, text that I just read. Look at verse 40 in Mark chapter 1. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. So a leper approaches Jesus. What's Jesus do? In verse 41, Jesus was moved with compassion. He put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. So Jesus sees him. He has compassion on him. He says, man, uh, I want to heal this man because of the way he approached me. Now notice verse 43. Or verse 42. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And notice what Jesus did. Something very strange. I'll explain it to you in just a second. And Jesus straightly charged him. It means he commanded him, this leper, and forthwith sent him away. What, what did Jesus do? He, he charged him. He said something to him, and then he sin, sent him away. And here's what it says in verse 44. Here's what Jesus said to him. And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man. Now, isn't that odd to you that Jesus would heal a man of a flesh-eating disease, leprosy? Uh, your skin uh, would rot away and eventually would kill you. And you would basically, uh, you were very contagious and you had to live in a, a little uh confined place, a little compound where, where basically people were uh, just uh, together and they were sick together, but you couldn't go out there and you had to, if you went in public, you had to cry unclean, unclean because you, you were highly contagious. Jesus had compassion on this man and this man met Jesus and Jesus heals him, but then he says, uh, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody in verse 44 but then he tells him to do something. He says, but go thy way and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Understand this, that in those days a leper could not uh, worship in the temple. A leper was forbidden to go into the temple. So he says, I want you to immediately go to the temple and I want you to offer that sacrifice. I want you to go see the priest and present yourself clean. But don't tell anybody. Well, what does this leper do? <laughs> Look at verse 45. But he went out and began to what? Publish it. 
Now, I want to tell you right now, let's not be too hard on this leper. Because I would have done the same thing. I just met Jesus. I just had all these things wrong with me. And I don't know what part of his body. It might have been his face or his hands. It could have been his feet. But whatever it was, it was bandaged. And no doubt it was painful and humiliating and embarrassing. And he meets Jesus and now his skin is like a baby. But he's commanded to keep quiet about it. Why did Jesus tell him that? Because he knew the hearts of man. Men were not interested in Jesus the Son of God, they were interested in what Jesus could do for them. You read the whole Gospel of Mark, it was what they could get out of Jesus. wonder if this Jesus can fix this, and I wonder if this Jesus can fix this, but they were not interested in who Jesus was. And Jesus said, don't tell anyone. I want them to find out on their own. What does this leper do, though? He couldn't help it. He began to herald He began to publish it. If you go over just for sake of time tonight, Mark chapter 5, there's a demon, uh, a man that's full of demons in this, uh, the Gadarenes, they called him the demoniac of the Gadarenes, and he was there living the maniac of Gadara in the tombs, in the cemetery. Jesus comes across the sea there, and he sees that man, that man runs to him, he falls at his feet, and that man is, uh, Jesus rebukes the demons, and they go into a herd of swine, and they go over a cliff and they die and that man is sitting there at the feet of Jesus and he says Jesus can I follow you the rest of your life you've delivered me and he believed and Jesus said no I don't need you to do that he said I want you to go home I want you to go home and tell your wife and your kids you're a new man What's that man do in Mark chapter 5? He goes to the next towns. The towns were called Decapolis. He goes to the next towns, meaning ten cities, and he begins to publish what Jesus has done. Are you starting to see uh, that when Jesus transforms your life, you're beginning to publish what Jesus has done? You get a good case of the I can't help it, and you begin to tell people about what Jesus has done for you. It's called gospel proclamation. We are commanded to herald the good news of Jesus Christ. When, When you start... Proclaiming the gospel, just go ahead and expect spiritual opposition. Because if you, if you go to that same chapter, and I know I'm giving you a Bible study tonight, but that's, it's Tuesday night. Let's just, let's just keep our Bibles open because the Word is enough. Amen. In verse 21, they, they go into Capernaum and there is a man. They go into a synagogue and, and I'm just prefacing through this, just giving you a little bit, not reading the entire text. But they're, they're in this synagogue and there's a man in there that has a demon. And Jesus encounters this man and begins to really wrestle in a spiritual sense with this man and pulls the demon out of this man. Now now understand, this is right before, the day before what we just read. The day before Jesus goes and gets up early in the morning and prays, Jesus encounters demons. And then if you read in verse 34... And He healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils. There it is. Many devils. And suffered not the devils to speak because they knew Him. Understand, right before Jesus prays early in the morning, He is encountered by demons. Nowhere in history has demonic forces ever been more prevalent than it was in Jesus' day. His power drew them out. You you can read church history, you can read the Bible, but but nowhere, everywhere Jesus went, have you ever noticed that? Everywhere Jesus went in the Gospels, He encountered demons. Why? His power drew them out. Now, just because that happened in Jesus' day does not mean that it does not happen today. We are in a spiritual war. Matter of fact, Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So understand, we're still up against spiritual warfare. So so why was Jesus doing this? Well, because the gospel was going forth. And everywhere the gospel goes forth, you can expect spiritual opposition. Then secondly, not only do we have a commission in verse 39, but we, we have a challenge that we face. Look with me in verse 36. The Bible says, And Simon, this is Peter, 
And they that were with him, that was the other disciples, followed after him, Jesus. And when they had found him, Jesus, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said, Jesus, unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. I want you to see something here, church. The challenge that Jesus faces is not necessarily a bad thing. Often we, we see challenges that come to us and we, we automatically assume it's temptation. Bad. We, we, we know to stay away from bad things. There's no temptation taking you such as common to man, but God is faithful. Understand, we know that temptation is wrong. We know sin is wrong. And so anytime we're being pulled to sinful things, we should resist the devil. And the Bible says he'll flee from you. But that's not what this is. Jesus was actually being pulled to urgent matters. Well, what's happening? Well, just read the text before. Look at verse 29. And forthwith, when they were coming out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon, Peter, and Andrew, with him, James, and John. But Simon's wife's mother, so his mother-in-law, lay sick of a fever, and they tell him of her. And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto them. So Jesus goes into this house. I believe this is the house that Jesus lived in in his earthly ministry. And at least in the northern region there in Capernaum. And Jesus was staying there with Peter and his family. And the mother-in-law was laying on a cot. And she had fever and she was sick near unto death. And Jesus sees that. And he goes and immediately touches her. And she gets right up she is immediately healed notice what happens and that even verse 32 meaning at the very very evening about this time of the day about this time right now when the sun did set they brought unto him the disciples all that were diseased and all them that were possessed with devils now hold on jesus is inside he's in the house the whole town hears what's going on because Jesus has been healing people. He's done cast a demon out of somebody. He's done healed a mother-in-law. And everybody's hearing what this man is doing. And they bring everybody to the doorstep of the house. I don't know about y'all, but all means all in the Greek. Y'all understand? Everybody's included. They're all standing at the door with their lanterns. They're standing there and they're waiting. I'm talking about they have cancer. They have pneumonia. They've got demons. You can imagine the line out the door all the way into the road and throughout the city. And what's Jesus do? Verse 33, And all the city was gathered together at the door, and He healed many that were sick of divers disease, and cast out devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. I believe this. I believe Jesus healed the entire town that night. The entire town. He stayed up as long as they were coming and he was healing people. And, and I'm sure it was unbelievable little kids with diseases. And I'm sure there was the elderly there with diseases. And Jesus was touching them and praying for them. And demons were being pulled out of people. It was unbelievable. Can't you imagine this though? Can you imagine? Jesus is all God, but He's all man. He's tired. The challenge, He slips away when that line dwindles down. He slips away into the woods and He, he goes up there. And what's He do? In verse 35, He, he got up way before everybody else. Maybe just, just maybe a, a few minutes of, of some rest. He gets up before anybody else and He goes and He prays. And while he's in the woods, or wherever he's at, the disciples find him and they say, Jesus, what are you doing? There is a mild rebuke. Jesus, what are you doing? The town is looking for you. This is a chance for you to make a name for yourself. This is a chance to get your name in lights. This is a chance for you to, to get your name on Instagram and Facebook and social media and all the likes and the follows and ever. I mean, Jesus, what are you doing? Your name is trending on Twitter. 
And he says, let's go to the next town. That I may preach there also. For that is the reason why I came. Why did Jesus go and pray? I'm going to show you. In verse 35, uh, he, it shows that Jesus went to, to pray because he knew that he was going to be pulled to the urgent things and he was going to miss the important things. Church, here's, here's why I believe that we're in, in a very dangerous time in our American Christianity. It's because we've lost our focus on what truly matters. I know it's an election year. I know here in just about a little bit, people's going to be racing home to see people debating and fighting, and I'm just about sick of it already. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of hearing about it. But here's what happened. We are so enamored with all the things going on in this world that we have lost our focus on the true need at hand. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Oh, you say, Pastor, are you saying that the things don't matter? Election? No, I'm not saying. Listen, I'll vote this November and I'll vote according to the Bible and vote right. I love our nation. Don't, don't misunderstand me, but understand this. We one day will spend thousands and thousands and thousands of years worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the only thing you can take with you to heaven is one more person. Let's not lose our focus. Verse 35 shows the reason why. Because he knew there was a challenge. He, he knew that we were to, to commission, the great commission. But thirdly, we see the communion we pursue. In verse 35, it just says that he, in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. The primary reason that I started from the back to the front is to show you the need, not, not how to do prayer. This is not a message on how to pray. This is a message about sacrificial prayer. Rising up a great while before day. It's an unhurried time. See, Jesus engages something sacrificial. It's an unhurried time. Jesus gave up something. Well, what did Jesus give up? He gave up sleep. I mean, between the hours of 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, Jesus is getting up, meaning that he, he really didn't get his 8 hours in. He didn't get his 6 hours in. He didn't get his 3 hours in. Jesus didn't get hardly any sleep. But he still wanted to commune with his Father. Why? Because he knew that just a little bit the disciples would be searching him out. Pulling him to the urgent. I pastor a church. Our church is growing and it's, it's, it's truly unbelievable what God has done there in that, in that time. I've been there nine years and when I got there we had about 50 people. About 50 people. And, uh, and a good, wonderful group of people, and they voted us in, and we had a lot of debt. We had about a half a million dollars of debt at that time. That was a lot for us, barely making it, barely making it. Uh, we, we were scraping, the, I mean, the bottom of the barrel every month trying to just make ends meet. But we preached the Word. We, we had prayer meetings. We, we saw God do some miracles there, and then, boy, God started just saving people and baptizing folks and bringing them in. And this past Sunday we had, I don't know, seven, eight hundred people show up for church and uh, two or three services in the mornings and having to build. We bought a new building a few years ago and already filled that up. And, and, uh, and God's just done some things. And, and, and people ask all the time, Pastor, how, how, how did that happen? I, honestly, I don't know other than we have tried to keep the important thing the main thing. And all the things that pulls us to the distracting noise of the world, we've, we've had to say, you know what? Yellow, red, black, and white, they're all precious in His sight. Preach the gospel. Love people. Because we know as a pastor that the phone's going to ring, the texts are going to go off, 
And I have to spend time with God. I have to spend time with God. I give my mornings to God. You read the old Puritan preachers. You you read the old preachers of the past. I'm talking about of yesteryear. You know what they did in the mornings? They gave their mornings to God. And we're giving everything away to people. Listen, I I think we ought to give it to people because we shepherd them. But understand this. Our communion with God is what matters. Most of the time our prayers start with a period already at the end of them. God, I have five minutes, I'll give it to you. God, I have 15 minutes. God, I have 30 minutes, I'm driving through this Mooresville traffic. I'll talk, and there's nothing wrong with that. Understand this, God will take anything. That's not what this is. This is not multitasking prayer. This is deliberate, intentional Getting up before every... You say, oh, Pastor, you don't understand this. I, I've got a hectic schedule. I already get up early. Hey, God's not going to call you to do something and not give you grace to do it. Amen. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is how we continue in the mission that God has given us. Unhurried time. An unhurried time. An undistracted place. Just alone with God. No distractions. No cell phones, nothing in there, no TV going, just you and God. And the more you do that, the less you'll find yourself being pulled to urgent matters. Urgent matters. My time with God is what truly matters. I want my, I I, I look forward to it. Oh, I, I have room to improve, but understand this, I look forward to my time with God because we live in such a busy world. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads this evening. I I just want to give a a prayer for you as as a church, but I also, if God spoke to your heart in a special way, I want to pray for you specifically because a, a message like this truly is where revival is birthed. Revival is not in a service. Revival is not in a 7 o'clock p.m. Tuesday night service. Revival begins in your heart. When you leave this place and you're like, God, I'm missing that time with you. And I feel myself being pulled to things that don't matter. They just don't matter. God, help me in this area. If God spoke to your heart this evening in that matter, would you... Would you ever be so honest as to say, Pastor, would you just pray for me? And I'm going to pray from up here, but would you pray for me in that matter? Would you slip a hand up? Oh, yeah, all over this building. Uh, Understand this. I'm not up here as an expert. There are no experts. We all have room to improve when it comes to spending time with the Lord. But understand this. That's what truly matters Gospel proclamation and my communion with God. If there's someone here tonight that says, Pastor, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior, tonight would be the greatest night. The greatest night. To invite you to to know who Jesus is. Is there anyone here tonight that would say, Pastor... I don't know Christ as my Savior, but I sure would like to. Would you please pray for me? Is there anyone here tonight that say, Pastor, pray for me? Would you slip a hand up? I'd love to pray for you. If you don't know Him, please don't leave tonight. If you raised your hand and you said, Pastor, I I want to make that decision, but I want to make it, and and I really want to, I really mean business. I want that to begin tonight. Listen, uh, the pastor's already up here and he's praying. You're not alone, but if you'd like to come and kneel at an altar, you certainly can. I don't know how you do invitations, but you're invited tonight to make a decision if you'd like. If you'd like, I'm going to pray in just a moment. For those of you that raised your hand tonight, I'm going to pray for you and pray for the services here at Community and ask God's blessing on tonight's message and may it not be forgotten 
I know most messages are forgotten in a day or two, but, but may this one not be forgotten. This is what matters. Lord, you've heard uh, the word preached tonight. You've heard our hearts. Uh, Lord, you've heard what has been said. It's just right here in the Bible. Lord, we have God's word and it's given through your spirit. And that's what makes it so powerful. Lord, my thought tonight is, is really not my thought. It's your heart. My prayer is that I preached it the way that you would want me to. Lord, you saw hands that went up tonight knowing that they have a hurried time and they have a really a, a place that's been bogged down and busy. And Lord, my prayer tonight is that our people tonight will spend time with you without a period on the end. That God, they will get to know you before the world wakes up. They'll spend time with you and not just sing about you and not just preach about you and talk about you, but know you. And Lord, I pray tonight that we will get our focus back. Help us, Lord, to get our focus back on the great commission that you have given us. This is the message of the hour. Help us, God. And for these things, we'll give you the praise and glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jonathan. How many of you is glad you came to church tonight? Amen. Thank you, man of God, for the word of God. It's funny that he preached that tonight. Well, it ain't funny. It's the point of God that he preached that tonight. I told some people earlier last week that I messaged Craig Edwards. It seemed like he go to a church and it had one person, and when he left, it had a thousand at it. And I asked him one night, I texted him and I asked him, and I said, How do you do it? And he said, Two words, just pray. The other night when he came through the doors of the church, I stood back there at the back of the church and We was talking, and I reminded him of that conversation, and he said, let me give you a piece of advice. He said, preach the gospel, forget politics, forget personal opinion, and just preach the Lord. He said, and when you do that, God will let everything else fall into place. The man of God followed that up tonight. Thank you for obeying God. Man, is every heart free this evening before we dismiss? If so, Brother Johnny Pike, you want to close us out in prayer?